Good morning. Welcome. And we're going to begin our worship and saying together these words from Psalm 66, verses 1 through 4. 1 through 4. So let's say them together. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Let's stand together and let's sing Worthy of Worship. Worthy of worship, worthy of praise, worthy of honor and glory. Of all the glad songs we can sing, worthy of all of the offerings we bring, you are worthy, Father, Creator, you are worthy, Savior, Sustainer, you are worthy. and praise worthy of reverence worthy of fear worthy of love and devotion worthy of bowing and bending of knees worthy of all this and added to Welcome to Quaker Gap. It's again a wonderful uh, blessing to be together, to worship our God, uh, to lift up our voices, although muffled by masks, in praise of Him, and uh, to just from our heart make sure that He knows what a great God He is uh, in all of our lives. And so I want to welcome you today. Uh, just a few announcements. First of all, these flowers today are presented in memory of Hoover Brown. Those of you who know and love Hoover Brown, uh, we just uh, praise God for Him and His life. And Know that he's with the Lord, singing with the angels, but we praise God uh, for opportunity to remember him today through these flowers. Uh, I want you to know that there are no Wednesday evening activities this week because it is Thanksgiving week. Uh, and I want to wish you a happy Thanksgiving, whatever that might look like for your family. And just pray that you have a great time together of uh, gathering and however that looks. Uh, I, I pray that the, the Lord will bless your time together. Uh, in addition to that, let you know that our next Wednesday takeout meal will be December 2nd. So that's a week from Wednesday, and uh, we're looking forward to that again and um, starting back up on December the 2nd. There is a Seeds of Hope Angel Tree in the foyer of the Fellowship Hall. If you'd like to take one of the ornaments off there and purchase a gift for an at-risk child, that'd be a wonderful thing this time of the year. Uh, to uh, reach out to our uh, neighbors and those who have needs. So give you that opportunity if you would like. 
Uh, and I think that does it for all the announcements I have. There is no children's church today. Unfortunately, our children's church staff, someone wasn't feeling well, so they just shut it down for today. Uh, so uh, kids, you're going to do a great job right here. I guarantee, you know, you're going to impress us all. They'll probably do a better job than some of our adults, to be honest with you. And uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we welcome your presence here in our midst. And we are so grateful, O oh Lord, to be able to worship you. God, remind us this morning of your power and your majesty and your beauty and your strength through your word. May every song that we sing be lifted up as praise to you. Lord, take this service, make it your own. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing it with me. Water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no one like you unlike you our God is greater our God is stronger but you are higher than any other our God is healer awesome and and turn to Psalm 29, Psalm 29. It's a beautiful psalm written by David to be sung by the people of Israel as a reminder of how great God is. And if God is on your side, then you have nothing to fear. Uh, and David here, it gives us a picture of a storm coming in. 
And I hope you'll see the imagery as we read. Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that at the end of every storm, you bring peace. No matter what storms we face in this life, O Lord, that you are here with us to walk beside us, to walk through them. Father, to provide your strength and your power to bring healing to bring encouragement, to lift us up, and Father, to prepare us for eternity. We praise you and we thank you for the opportunity to worship together this morning. Thank you for bringing this group of people together, those who came at nine. And Lord, I pray that your name would be lifted above all names. Lord, we do want to pray for those in our church family who are hurting, those who are ill, those who are facing uh, medical difficulties. We just lift them up to you and pray for healing. We think specifically today of Junior George, Uh, who's in the hospital with pneumonia. And we ask, Lord, that uh, you might bring healing to him and encouragement to his family. We pray for those who, uh, Lord, are are facing uh, this COVID-19 crisis. We ask, Lord, for healing for them. As they quarantine, Lord, that you would be with them. Father, uh, we pray for any in our congregation who are um, battling with cancer and with surgeries and are healing from recent surgeries. And we ask, Lord, for, for day by day for your strength for them. And Lord, we want to ask, Father, that you might use us as your people in this week, Father, to to draw attention to your name. Lord, that as we have opportunity to give thanks with our family, that, uh, Lord, we would make sure that folks know that you are the one to whom we give our thanks for all that we have and all that we are. Lord, we praise your name and ask, Lord, that you would take this service and use it for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. fills the night it cannot hide the light whom shall I fear you crush the enemy underneath my feet you are my sword and shield though troubles linger still whom shall I fear before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. strength is in your name, for you alone can save, you will deliver me, yours is the victory, whom shall I fear, whom shall I fear, I know who goes before me, I know who Who reigns forever? He is a friend. 
some reason, I don't know, as we were singing that song uh, and I was reflecting on how I'm going to start this message, I was remembering a Sunday morning cartoon show we used to watch when I was a kid called Fat Albert. Anybody watch Fat Albert when you were growing up? Yeah, it was uh, Bill Cosby put this thing together. One of the things I remember about Fat Albert was that uh, one good thing about Fat Albert was if he was on your football team, right, uh, you just put a helmet on him, gave the ball in his hand, and he ran ahead and you stood behind him and just ran with him. Nobody could take him down. He would run all the way to the end zone and spike the football. And, you know, if you had Fat Albert on your team, then you were going to win. And I guess I'm thinking about how God is so powerful, so wonderful, so huge, that if he's on your side, uh, there's nobody that can stand against you. So does anybody still watch football, by the way? Anybody out there still watch football? Boy, some of you are saying, no, I don't watch football. I know some of you. You say, Oh, I've had it with football, and then Monday night comes, and you're like, I wonder who's winning. I wonder what's on. Uh, so, yeah, 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 right? But I want you to recognize that there are some similarities between uh, church services and football. For example, you know what a bench warmer is, right? In, in church, it's a person who does not sing, doesn't pray, doesn't work, doesn't get involved, apparently doesn't do anything, but just sits there. You know, we might call them pew warmers at churches. Uh, do you know what a quarterback sneak is? It's when all the church members quietly leave during the invitation. It's kind of hard to, kind of hard to do when the door is locked in the back. Um, you know what a draw play is? It's what many children do on the bulletin during the worship service. Do you remember when we used to have bulletins? Uh, those days were nice. Uh, maybe we'll go back to those someday. Halftime is that period between Sunday school and worship when many choose to leave. And usually the pastor's walking up to the church and sees that happen on Sunday morning. Uh, the backfield in motion is when you make a trip to the back to use the restroom or the water fountain during the service. And a running back is a person who makes multiple trips to the restroom <laughs> during the service. Pass interference is the look on mama's face when she sees you passing a note to one of your friends during the service. And staying in the pocket, some of you probably got this one figured out already, is what happens too many times when the plate is passed through the church. Staying in the pocket. The two-minute warning is the point at which you realize the sermon's almost over and people start getting all their stuff together. Uh, and then the instant replay is when the preacher loses his notes and he falls back on last week's illustrations. And you say, I think I've heard this before. And sudden death is what happens to the attention span of the congregation if the preacher goes over time. And that happened this morning, so I'm trying to figure out how to pair some stuff from this message right now. Uh, the illegal use of hands is clapping at an inappropriate point of the service. Uh, and then a trap is when you're called on to pray and you happen to be asleep at that moment. <laughs> an end run is when you have to get out of church quick without speaking to anyone. And so you make your way through uh, as quickly as possible. The halfback option is the decision that 50% of the congregation, more than that really, make when they come to the morning service and decide not to go to small groups at all. And then the blitz is the rush for restaurants following the closing prayer. Uh, so you see that football and church services have a lot in common. Also, I want you to consider these Bible verses. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, not 4.13. We all know what that one says, but 3.13 
forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal. Now, obviously, Paul was talking about football in that passage of Scripture. In Job chapter 19, verse 8, we read, He has blocked my way, so I cannot pass. And me being a Jets fan, I understand what that one's all about. Uh, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33 in the Living Bible says, We toss the coin, but it is the Lord who controls its decision. And 1 Samuel 16, 17, we'll call this the coach's verse. Find someone who plays well and bring him to me. I think maybe Saul was talking about a harpist that he was looking for, but we can take all these out of context and pretend they have to do with football. The truth of the matter is that some of us ministers, and James and I probably do this a lot, Monday morning, we think back over the service and how things went. And it's kind of like reviewing the tape, except these days it happens for real as we actually review the tape. We say to ourselves, you know, there's a few things we need to do differently next week. The few things didn't go quite the way that we had planned them. Uh, and we'd like to go back and make some changes, just like a Monday morning quarterback. Uh, and, and we pastors have a way of measuring effectiveness in churches. Unfortunately, it's not perhaps the right way to measure uh, effectiveness. Nickels and noses. Nickels and noses. Some people say bucks and butts. How much went into the offering plate and how many people showed up? And that's how we determine how effective the service was. But the truth of the matter is that it doesn't matter how much money was brought in the offering plate or how many people actually showed up uh, or even how great our performance was. You know, whether we played a few wrong notes, whether we stumbled over our words a few times, that's not what God is looking for. God is not concerned with how many people are sitting in the pew this morning. He's not concerned about how much was brought in this morning. That, those aren't the numbers he's going to look at. He's not concerned about how well our performance was. God's measurement is, was I lifted up in the hearts of those people on that, in that service? That's what it is. Were, were people walking out impressed with me because of what happened in that service? And does worship continue outside of these doors? Because... Worship on a Sunday morning is kind of like a booster shot. <laughs> that we come in, we get our booster shot, and we walk out, and we continue to worship throughout the week. And so this is what impresses God. This is what he's looking for. That worship is not state of the art to him. It's state of the heart. And that's what he's looking for. So last Sunday, we began a series of messages called The Word on Worship. The first question we addressed is, what is worship? And the definition that we came up with is, worship is the full life response. Your head, your heart, and your hands to who God is and what he has done. So worship is not just about us coming together on a Sunday morning and singing a few songs. Worship is your whole life. It is your whole response as a human being toward who God is and what he has done. And it's what you say, and it's what you do, and it's how you feel. It's all worship. And then we moved on to why we worship. And we saw from Scripture that God designed us as human beings to worship, that we can't get away from it, that we as human beings were designed by God and created by God with the need to worship. So there's some things that are true of us as human beings. We eat. We're going to find out about that on Thursday. That's what we always do. We eat. We sleep. We worship. It's a part of who we are. It's what we do. And there are many things and people in this life that are praiseworthy. Part of being a human being is drawing attention to praiseworthy things in life. So when you watch a football game or a NASCAR race or a golf tournament and you are impressed by physical feats that take place there and say, wow, that was awesome. That's praise. Do you realize it? When you see a movie that moves you and touches you, or you watch a YouTube video that makes you laugh and you say to someone, you got to watch this, you got to watch this, or you send it to them. What you're doing is you're praising. That's what we do as human beings. Whenever you make a big deal about anything, you are exercising your praise muscle. And there's nothing wrong with this. There are a lot of things in life that are praiseworthy. In fact, Proverbs chapter 31, our favorite Mother's Day passage says about this woman, honor her, for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. We're saying that this woman deserves 
praise because of who she is. It's a good thing for us to find praiseworthy people and to make a big deal out of them. It's not a sin for us to recognize beauty and achievement and greatness in this world, to be impressed with it and to lift it up and to praise it. However, as normal as it is for us to esteem that which deserves praise in our world, and there's a lot that does, we must be careful to reserve our highest praise for the one who deserves it the most. So yeah, sports are fun, fun to participate in, fun to watch. Movies are entertaining. You know, there are certainly uh, some talented musicians out there that are worth listening to, but God is everything. He is our all in all, and he deserves the highest praise. So we continue our series this morning with who we worship. And we just read Psalm 29. I want you to make sure that you have Psalm 29 handy as we go through this. Psalm 29 was written by David as a hymn of praise to the Lord. But there's much more taking place in this psalm than meets the eye. Right? The competing religions of David's day were the pagan religions of the Canaanites. You you may remember that when Israel came into the promised land, that they defeated the Canaanites and they drove them from their villages and their cities and their homes, and that the Israelites took over those cities. One thing that the Israelites did not do that they should have done was to also drive out the false gods and the false worship and the idolatry of the Canaanites. So from time to time, they had trouble with these things. Whenever the people of Israel got tired of the Lord their God, which happens from time to time, they turned away from God to these foreign idols and gods. So they would say things like, you know, old Yahweh, he's just old fashioned. You know, he was good enough for grandma, but I don't know. I I think there's some newer gods out there that I might try out, something a little different. Time for me to move on and to experiment. You know, some of my friends are hiking up to the high places and they're going to build an altar up there and they're going to make a sacrifice there and they're going to erect an Asherah pole and they're going to bow down before this pole. Some of my friends are carving some idols and and we're going to get together and worship these idols. It looks pretty cool. I might just give that a try. Short beats that trip up to Jerusalem. And so they began to walk away from Jerusalem the true God of Israel, who had brought them into the promised land, and they began to worship other gods. And one of the gods that impressed the Canaanites and some of the Israelites was the lightning god by the name of Baal. And I know that you're used to saying Baal here, but my Hebrew professor taught me very well. He taught me better. He said, look, the way you pronounce it is Baal. Okay, so say that with me, Baal. Baal. I know it might be a little bit different for you, but Baal is what you pay to get out of prison. Baal is what you do with hay, right? You bail it up. Baal is a plug and a pump in the bottom of your boat. But Baal is the Canaanite god of lightning and energy and sun. And huge storms used to, used to kick up off the Mediterranean Sea, and they would devastate the plains and the hillsides of of Canaan. And since these were the most powerful forces that were known to mankind during those days, these great lightning and thunderstorms and the wind that came from them, that they came up with gods in order to explain these storms. And they built altars and they burned sacrifices and they crafted graven images to this Baal, hoping that they could earn from him the ability that he probably would not destroy them. So I'd say, look, if we just bow down before this Baal storm god, maybe he'll save our crops. Maybe he'll keep us from dangers. And so David wrote Psalm 29 as a praise song to Yahweh, the one true God, the God of Israel, the most high God. Um, And he wrote this as a polemic against Baal. So in other words, what he's doing here is he's saying, look, those of you who are worshiping the Canaanite god Baal, and you think that his storm is pretty magnificent, you just wait and see what Yahweh can do because you ain't seen nothing yet. And he describes the God of Israel. So do you mind if we spend a little bit of time taking this psalm apart? 
this morning, Psalm 29. Okay, I got the thumbs up. That's good because that's what I had planned to do. <laughs> It'd be hard to shift gears right now. <laughs> well, but we can break into this psalm into three chunks. The first chunk is verses 1 and 2, which is the call to praise. The call to praise. And look at that with me. He says, ascribe to Yahweh, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to Yahweh glory and strength. Ascribe to Yahweh the glory due his name. Worship Yahweh in the splendor of his holiness. And it's obvious that the theme of his song is Yahweh. Now, you probably have the word Lord in your translation, and it's probably in capital letters. The word Lord in capital letters in your translation is the name of God for the people of Israel. It is a four-letter Hebrew name for the one true God uh, of Israel, Yahweh. It is Yod, He, Vav, He, four consonants. And the name is sometimes transliterated into English as Jehovah or Yahweh. Whenever the rabbis of Israel came across this name as they were reading scripture, they would never say the name Yahweh. They would say the name when they got there. Or they would use another word for Lord, which was Adonai, and they would substitute that name. But they would not say the name of Yahweh. But make no mistake, the Lord that David is writing about here in this passage of scripture is the Lord who identified himself to Moses as Yahweh, the great I am, the one true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And the name Yahweh appears 17 times in this short psalm. So there's no question that Yahweh is the star of David's psalm here. Uh, it's like if you were to listen to Dolly Parton sing the song Jolene and later on ask yourself, hmm, I wonder who that song's about. <laughs> there's no doubt who that song's about, right? And there's no doubt that this song is about Yahweh, the one true God, the God of Israel. David calls upon the heavenly beings to ascribe glory to Yahweh. And who are the heavenly beings? Well, the heavenly beings here are literally translated the sons of God. David says, sons of God, I want you to ascribe to Yahweh glory and strength. The NIV translates this heavenly beings because throughout the Old Testament, whenever you see the sons of God, it's talking about the angels. But at the beginning of the book of Job, the angels come to report to Yahweh. And we read, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. What's happening here is that there are angels who are reporting to God. Satan himself being an angel, albeit a fallen angel, comes to present himself before God as well. The sons of God are the angels. So David is saying this, starting from the angelic beings all the way down to every person, every human being on earth, David says we need to ascribe glory to God. So what does it mean to ascribe glory to God? It means to acknowledge who God is, to recognize who God is, and to proclaim who God is. Some translations like the King James Version have the word give. It says, give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. So while there's nothing wrong with that translation, it's not we who give glory and strength to God as if God needs it from us. It's not, we give God his strength and glory. No, it's not, it's not the way it works. God already is all glorious. God is already all powerful. If no human being ever were created or existed to sing his praise, if no angel circled the throne and said a word about God, he would still be all glorious and all-powerful. He doesn't need our worship. He is already all-glorious and all-powerful. You know, some people say if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there, does it make a sound? No one's there to hear it. Does it still make a sound? And the answer to that question is, of course it makes a sound. Just because nobody's there to hear it doesn't mean that it falls quietly. It still makes a sound. And listen, if there is no human being to ascribe glory to God, what does Jesus say? The rocks will cry out to praise his name. 
When you ascribe glory to the Lord, you are stopping to recognize him and to acknowledge who he is from your heart. Right? It's kind of like when you see a rainbow that you stop for a moment and you experience it because rainbows are beautiful and they are rare. Uh, and so you stop for a moment and you might whip out your cell phone and snap a picture of it and put it on Instagram and say, look, this rainbow I saw. Right? And, and you get the kids and you say, quick, kids, you got to see this. Quick, before it goes away. And you bring them outside and you show them, look at that beautiful rainbow. And, you know, there are times when I've been just sitting in the house reading a book or something, and I'm, suddenly my phone will blow up, and I'll say, what's going on? I'll look at it. And there'll be all these Instagram photos of rainbows. I say, everybody's looking at this rainbow. And so I'll head outside and look, and it's gone. I missed it. Well, the rainbow was just as beautiful, just as glorious, whether I saw it or not. But the fact is, when we see it, we express within our heart, isn't that beautiful? Wasn't this something? And we share it with our friends. The same is true of our Lord. When we ascribe glory and strength to our God, we are recognizing him and experiencing it for ourselves, saying, isn't God strong and powerful? That's what worship is. When we stop and ascribe to the Lord what is already true of him, it says it's already due to him. We owe it to him already. So when we sing like his name is wonderful, we are recognizing the truth about him. He is 100% wonderful. Whether we say it or not, whether we sing it or not, he is wonderful. But we have been created by God to express wonder of him. And we are fulfilled as human beings created in the image of God when we ascribe wonder to him. So David also tells us how we are to come into this worship. Ascribe to Yahweh the glory to his name. Worship Yahweh in the splendor of his holiness. And the splendor of his holiness is how we are to appear before God. And it literally means in holy attire. You know, in other words, get dressed up for the occasion. You know, show up before the Lord in your best holy garments and worship him. So the priests had these special vestments that they wore in order to worship. You know, some pastors still wear these fancy robes today when, when we come together for worship. Um, but, you know, I believe that in our day and age, when we come to worship God, what is it that we wear? What is the holy garment that we wear as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ? By faith in him, as the hymn writer says, we appear before the Lord dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. So we wear the garment of praise, which is our Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness upon us. Doesn't matter how you come dressed for worship. You know, scripture says we should dress modestly. Scripture says we should, we should come and, and worship our God. It doesn't say that you need to wear a tie or a suit or any special clothing. But it does say that if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are covered in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is our garment of praise. So David calls all heaven and earth to show up in our holiest attire to acknowledge the glory and the power that is due to Yahweh. That's the call to praise. So we move on to the heart of the psalm, which is found in verses 3 to 9, which is the cause for praise. The cause for praise. And this is where David begins picking on Baal. And anyone who would choose to worship that fake Canaanite lightning god, David has words for them. He doesn't mention Baal in this passage, but he really doesn't have to. David joins with the chorus of angelic beings that he is called upon to ascribe glory and strength to Yahweh. And the way that he does it is he makes some observations. He says in verse 3, The voice of Yahweh is over the waters. The glory of God thunders. Yahweh thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of Yahweh is powerful. The voice of Yahweh is majestic. It's almost as if David is standing at the edge of the Mediterranean Sea and he's watching as this small cloud begins to approach. And suddenly he's, he hears the boom of thunder all around him. Um, like Elijah of old praying over an altar on a clear day when suddenly out of nowhere the thunder begins to rumble. And so God's voice is like a clap of thunder out of nowhere. And maybe you've heard that before. It's unexpected. It's loud. It's majestic. It shakes you every fiber of your being. You never saw it coming. It echoes 
over the water and it stirs in your heart. And David says, the voice of the Lord is like thunder. You cannot escape its power and its splendor. And he continues, the voice of Yahweh breaks the cedars. Yahweh breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian, like a young wild ox. He's talking about trees and mountains here. Right? Lebanon is Mount Lebanon. Syrian is Mount Hermon. He's talking about the trees and the mountains. Now this storm has moved off of the sea and it's on the land. And it is uh, doing its worst. It is snapping even the largest trees in its path like toothpicks. And splinters are flying everywhere. The cedars of Lebanon for the people of Israel, it's kind of like the redwood forest for us as Americans. Right? If you've ever been there, those are the biggest trees on our continent. And you stand by these massive trees. Right? And you take pictures of them and bring the slides home and show your friends and they're not impressed. Because it doesn't look so great picture-wise. But these things, when you stand next to them, are massive in height and girth. And you can't even put your arms around them. You stand by these huge trees and you're so impressed by their majesty. And what is it that David says about the cedars of Lebanon? He says they break into pieces. They snap like toothpicks at the strength and the glory of God. And then he says, even these great mountains skip like young little animals skipping through the forest. The mountain, which is the most permanent thing in life, right? You drive up the road here and you see a mountain back here and it's always there. They, sometimes the clouds block it, but you know that mountain's there. Imagine one day you come up on a clear day and it's just gone. Where did it go? David says that the, the storm of the Lord, the power of God can make Mount Lebanon and Mount Hermon dance like little calves playing in the meadow. The force of the wind is so great, even the mighty mountains are powerless against it. And then the lightning strikes. Verse 7, the voice of Yahweh strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of Yahweh shakes the desert. Yahweh shakes the desert of Kadesh. So now we've moved from the great mountains of the northern parts of Israel to the deserts that are in the south of Israel. The whole earth is shook by the glory of God. And there is no escape. And I love the King James Version here where it says, The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. Isn't that a beautiful picture of lightning? The lightning as it begins with one broad stroke high in the sky and then it branches out and breaks and it divides into many branches into smaller strikes all over the earth. And this is the voice of God coming from heaven in one broad stroke and dividing into many branches. The voice of God striking everyone with its power and its fury and its beauty and its truth. So I had to Google lightning and I found out that every single second there is a lightning strike somewhere on planet Earth. Sometimes as many as 100 times a second, there is always lightning striking the Earth. And lightning is one of the greatest wonders of electricity. It is so powerful that it can contain up to a billion volts in any single strike. I was like, what is a billion volts like? Well, to put that into perspective, a taser, which can knock a man off his feet, can pulse with about 50,000 volts. 50,000 volts in a taser will knock you off your feet. What will a billion volts do to you? Would there be any hope for you if you were to be struck with a billion volts? Uh, and there's enough energy in a typical flash of lightning to light a 100 watt light bulb for about three months, right? If you could just harness the lightning in some way, uh, if you could just harness the lightning, but we can't. We can't. And so we burn coal instead of trying to harness the lightning. Lightning is a powerful picture of the glory of God and the strength of the Lord as it rips across the sky and pounds the earth and scatters sparks and fire in its path. And David is so impressed by the power of the storm. And he says, that storm is the voice of our God. I love God's questioning of Job in the book of Job when he says, can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you? Here we are, ready for duty. Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? 
Who can tip over the water jars of heaven when the dust becomes hard and the clods of earth stick together? God is saying, I am in control of the storm. I am the God of all of the weather. And none can compare to that God. There is no place on earth where God's voice is not heard, where his power is not known, because he booms with thunder and he flashes with lightning and he rushes like the wind. David continues, he says, The voice of Yahweh twists the oaks and strips the forest bare, and in his temple all cry glory. So if you've ever seen the aftermath of a tornado, you know exactly what it's talking about. The tornado skips from one section to another. But if it just hits the top of the tree, it twists the tree around and snaps it off at, uh, at, at the trunk and, and throws it aside as if it's nothing, as if it's child's play. And sometimes it whips through and it just peels the bark off of the trees. The trees are still standing, but the bark is gone. This is the power of Almighty God, and there's only one word for all of the angels. They are reduced to just one word at the awesomeness of the power, the strength, and the beauty of Yahweh. And it is glory, glory. There is no other reaction to the limitless power of God than to acknowledge his glory, to acknowledge his strength, to stand back and to recognize who he is and how powerful he is. He is glorious and awesome in his beauty. He is powerful and fearsome in his strength. For any human being to ignore him and to refuse to worship him is a crime. For any human being to be impressed with anything or anybody higher than their impression of God is just lunacy. It is idolatry. So what David is saying is this, set aside your gods because there is no God like our God. Baal is a weakling. He is a fake story. The real power is found in Yahweh. So come down from your high places, step away from your man-made idols and your false gods. They are powerless. Ascribe to Yahweh the power and the strength that is due to his name. So who do we worship? We worship Yahweh, the creator of heaven and earth, the God of Israel, the God of the, the earth, the God of the universe, the creator of all things, the God who sent his son to sacrifice his life for the forgiveness of all who will come to him by faith. So I need to show you this. In the Old Testament, through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord says, turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other by myself, I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me, every knee will bow. By me, every tongue will swear, and they will say of me, in the Lord alone are deliverance and strength. All who have raged against him will come to him and be put to shame. So according to this passage of scripture, who is it before whom every knee will bow and every tongue will swear? Who is it? It is Yahweh, the Lord alone. But then, you know, Paul in the New Testament, in the book of Philippians, um, continues. And he says, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So who is it, according to Paul in the New Testament, to whom every knee will bow and every tongue acknowledge? Who is it? It's Jesus. So back to the original question. To whom, according to the Old Testament, will every knee bow and every tongue swear? Yahweh. Follow-up question. According to the New Testament, to whom will every knee bow and every tongue confess? Jesus. So who is Jesus? Jesus is Yahweh. He is the one true God, the creator of heaven and earth, existing in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is who Jesus is. He is Yahweh, Jehovah of the Old Testament. This is Jesus. 
Whose voice is it that thunders and flashes with lightning, booms and shakes the earth from north to south, twisting mighty trees, making the mountains skip? It's the one and only Yahweh, our Lord and God. It's the one and only Jesus, his son. So David finishes his song with a conclusion in verses 10 and 11. And he says, Yahweh sits enthroned over the flood. See, in my mind, I see now that the storm has moved away. And we're just looking at the aftermath. And David says, Yahweh sits enthroned as king over the flood. Yahweh is enthroned as king forever. Yahweh gives strength to his people. Yahweh blesses his people with peace. As the storm recedes, the floodwaters are gone, uh, beginning to recede. David surveys the damage. And what does he say? He says, we know after watching this storm that Yahweh is king forever. There is no other. (coughs) Earthly kings, leaders, false gods come and go. But God is always on the throne. And he says, God is over his people and he brings strength and he brings peace to all who trust in him. That mighty power, that glorious strength of God is yours if you are a follower of him. I want to close with one of the greatest stories in all of scripture. It is the battle of the gods. It is the battle royale in scripture between Baal and Yahweh. And in this corner is Baal with his 450 prophets arrayed in their finest robes, surrounded by King Ahab and Queen Jezebel and all of the mighty and the majesty. Baal has his corner. In the other corner is Yahweh. He has one on his side. It's a wiry, bearded, rustic-looking prophet named Elijah. And they stand together on Mount Carmel, and the battle begins. So the prophets of Baal build an altar, and they call down fire from heaven. And they cry out as loud as they can to Baal. They jump up and down on the altar, screaming on the top of their lungs to Baal. They cut themselves and let themselves bleed over the altar, asking Baal to come and to, and to burn his, his fire upon this altar. At one point, Elijah calmly says, you know, maybe you need to shout a little bit louder. Maybe Baal's hearing's not so good these days. Maybe... You know, his hearing aid's gone out. Uh, he says, you know, maybe, maybe Baal needed a nap and you need to yell a little louder to wake him up. Maybe he's gone out to relieve himself. Maybe, maybe Baal can't hear. Just shout a little bit louder. Maybe you'll get his attention. Eventually, as the crickets keep chirping and there is no fire anywhere to be seen, Elijah says, y'all step over here a little bit closer because I don't want you to miss this. Everybody gather around my altar. I don't want you to miss a thing. And as they gather around the altar, Elijah instructs four men that he sees to grab barrels, to run down to the sea, to fill them with water, to run back up, and to pour them on the altar. Go ahead, just douse it. Once they're done with that, he looks at it and he says, you know what? It's still not wet enough. You guys... Can you grab those barrels, run down to the sea, get me four more barrels of water? They run up the hill and they douse it again. And Elijah looks at it and he says, you know what? In scripture, things are done in threes. (laughs) The Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why don't you take those those barrels and go back down? And I don't know, if I see these guys are like, oh, come on, Elijah, right? They are the unsung heroes in this story. They run down to the sea and they fill their barrels and they run back up. And and Elijah says, go ahead, pour them on. Might as well. And now, as you look at this altar, it is dripping with water, and there is a moat of water surrounding it, and it is completely drenched. Not even the finest Bic lighter could ever start, even a spark on that altar. And Elijah says, that's good. Now it's wet enough. Now we're ready. And here's what Elijah prays in 1 Kings chapter 18. He says, Yahweh, the God 
of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Yahweh, answer me. So these people will know that you, Yahweh, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Suddenly there is a crack of thunder and lightning comes from heaven and fire falls on the altar. The bull on the altar is completely consumed and innocent. Boom, it's gone. But that's not all. Because the wood on the altar is consumed as well. It's gone in an instant. But that's not all. The rocks around the altar are completely consumed. Have you ever seen rocks burn before? No, I haven't either, right? But that's still not all because all of the water, the moat of water surrounding the altar is lapped up by the fire and it's completely gone. You look at the place where an altar and once stood a bowl and wood and rocks and water and nothing's there but scorched earth. And we're told that the people fell on their faces and cried out, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. Oh, how we all need a moment of worship like that. Oh, how we all need an opportunity to see God in that way, to be reminded of who it is that we truly worship, to put away our little playthings and our trinkets and our idols and our baubles and to all of our weakling gods and to worship the one true God, the creator of the heavens and earth, to cry out to Yahweh and to fall on our faces, the only true God, to worship him through the power he has given us by his Holy Spirit through his son, Jesus Christ. That is the one that we worship. And let's never forget it. Folks, I know that you're going to uh, gather around uh, for Thanksgiving on this Thursday, and I don't know what that's going to look like for you be different for everyone this year. Uh, you know, even if it's just two of y'all in a turkey sandwich, you know, get, get some of uh, that cranberry sauce and wipe that on your sandwich. It'll be just like Thanksgiving, I tell you. But however it is that you celebrate Thanksgiving together, I pray that the God to whom you give gratitude is the Lord Jesus Christ, Yahweh, the creator of heaven and earth. He is the one who we worship the one who is due our praise. And any gratitude that we have for this strange year, as weird as it has been for all of us, all of that gratitude goes to God. And that God, the most powerful, the most high God, the King who sits on his throne for all eternity, is the God who walks with us every day and protects us and guides us and prepares us for eternity. How wonderful that this is the God that we worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you today for the reminder from your word of who you are. Father, we praise your name. We are grateful, O oh God, that you have given us visions in this world to demonstrate who you are. And even the great destructive, harrowing storms what are just a small depiction of your glory and your power. And yet Jesus was able to stand on the bow of the boat and say, peace be still. And so we know, Lord, whatever storm we might be facing in life right now, that we have a God who is in control of it and a God who will bring us through it and that there will be peace in the end. So we pray, Lord, that we would worship you. We would set aside all other gods, that we would reserve our highest praise for you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to close uh, our time together with a song. James is going to lead us in everlasting God. I'm going to ask you to stand and uh, as we sing and sing your praise to the God who is the creator of heaven and earth. Let's close with this song. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong believer. You are
will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Father, we confess that sometimes we get overwhelmed by the troubles and the issues and the disappointments of this life. God, I pray that you would remind us of how powerful you are, what a great God you are, and of how much you love us, and that you are on our side. So, Father, I pray that as we walk out through these doors, that we would continue, Lord, to worship you with our lives this week as we have opportunity to be thankful. Father, I pray that you would receive our gratitude, receive our worship and our praise. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.